thank you very much for having us here today. Um, we are not teachers, we're not orators, we're just people like yourself. And what we try to do is bring little bits and pieces of history together for you. You'll find a little bit someplace in one book, another little piece in another book. And we try to draw it together for you. And today you're in for a very special treat. Marsha Davis is a survivor. And before she starts, <coughs> one of the things I'd like to have you keep in mind was is your age. And the reason why I want to bring that up is she's a survivor. She was robbed of all the things that you enjoy at your age. She had no girlhood, no growing up period the way you have. So without further ado, let's bring in Marsha Davis. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, first, I want to apologize for last time not being able to come because I took sick. But now here I am, I'm feeling better, so I can talk to you. My name is Marsha, and I was born in a very small country. It was ca called Lithuania. And our little country was like a breadbasket or part of Europe because of all the crops they used to grow. And at certain times we were occupied by the Germans, by the Russians, and so on through history. In 1941, we were still occupied by the Russians. We were a Russian Republic. And as it happened, Stalin and Hitler made a pact and they practically divided up Europe and the Nazis finally came to our little country. But before we even saw one Nazi, <coughs> our own neighbors, which were the Lithuanians, did a terrific job on the Jewish population. What they did is form group. They were called the Fifth Colony. They just came into, they knew where, who their neighbors were. They came into our house, and there were a group of like eight or nine men. They put a machine gun on our kitchen table, which was one of those on the three little legs. And I heard one of the men say to his group, there isn't going to be any shooting in this house, but you can take whatever you want and they had a big wagon with horses outside. And they started taking things out and loaded up the wagon. As it turned out, one of the men knew my father. He worked with, with him in the same company. And that's why I guess he said there isn't gonna be any shooting. But for the next three days and three nights, that's all we heard. It's shooting three days and three nights without stopping. And of course, nobody left the house. After it got quieted down, I saw my father leave the house and without him knowing, I just followed him. I was a little girl and I wanted to go with daddy, I guess, and nobody noticed it. And as we ran into the first house that we knew some of our friends lived. Everyone was saturated with blood, even the ceiling. The whole family was shot and everybody was were laying every which way. Wherever they fell, that's where they stayed. And that was three days later. As my father turned around and he saw me standing there, he just picked up his finger and he th did like this. And I just ran back home to my mother. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but memories like this you cannot forget. When my father finally came home, it was late that day, 
and he helped a lot of our neighbors to collect a lot of bodies and take them to the Jewish cemetery because there was nobody to bury them. And that was like maybe eight square blocks of people that were killed within those three days and three nights. Six weeks later, the Germans marched in. Not a speck of dust on them. They marched in with their shiny boots and their tall hats, like nothing happened, and they took over. And of course, our neighbors pointed out where all the Jewish people lived, and this is how they knew where to go and where to do the most harm they can. It took them only 10 days to create the ghetto, which was on the outskirts of our capital in Lithuania. And they barbed wired it, and they collected whoever was alive, and they made an announcement through the streets that every person has a right to take one pillowcase, and in that pillowcase, you should put in a pair of underwear, an extra pair of shoes, one towel, and one piece of soap. And this is how we actually left our homes, and we were all situated in the ghetto. I just want you kids to picture it, if somebody would say that to your parents, that this is all they have a right to take, and this is how they have to live. How do you think your parents would feel? When you work a lifetime, you create a home for yourself, your husband, your children, and you have to leave it all, and you don't know where you're going. I don't think you kids can comprehend it. Of course, when we went into ghetto, there was no medical help, not even an aspirin. And if you got sick because you were undernourished, they only gave you one slice of bread a day and a bowl of soup. And as time went on, everybody was losing weight. And then you were started to be taken to slave labor. And it was the worst they could find to do for us. Whether it was digging ditches at their airport in some way to protect their planes. But when they created the ghetto, I don't know whether my mother had a certain knowledge or she was just very smart. When they gave her to fill out papers of the people that are in her family, she put my sister and myself down on the paper as being 20 years old. Now anybody that would look at us and look at the paper would see that it couldn't possibly be because we weren't even teenagers, let alone being 20. But they didn't have time to check the papers to compare it with the person. Excuse my voice. And this is how my mother kept us. She and my father used to hide us. It was a little basement that we had under the house. It wasn't a basement like you kids know. It was a dirt basement where we used to keep vegetables for the winter. And they used to hide us there and put this big cabinet over the area, so now when we see that there is a door there. And at night, when they used to come back, they gave us our slice of bread and some water. And they used to lock us in there 
and they used to say, do not cry, do not even sneeze, so nobody could hear you. Well, one night, my father came back, but my mother didn't. They put them in cattle cars and shipped her with another transport out to a different country, a neighboring country. And this is how we were separated from my mother. I don't know how my father managed it, because I, I cannot picture a man really taking care of two little girls. But he locked us in, and this is how we existed. And then they had a big selection, and they collected all the children. They ripped the babies out of the parents, of the mother's arms, and threw them in big military carts. Literally threw them. One of my aunts didn't want to give the baby up. She was clutching it in her arms. So they sent the German shepherds, two dogs on her, and they shredded her back. And naturally they took the baby and took the baby away. And this is how they took all the children. And if my mother wouldn't have done what she did, we would have been with those children. And those children died a terrible death. Our blood wasn't good enough for anybody else, I mean, of being a person. <coughs> but what they did is drain the baby's blood and send it to the front line and gave it to their soldiers. I can guarantee you that to this day, there are old Germans that are maybe my age and older that were soldiers that needed transfusions and they'll never know that they were saved by Jewish blood. Tell me about being Aryan pure. They only did what was good for them. They robbed all of Europe and gave it and shipped it all to Germany. We didn't know where my mother was for like six to eight months. I'm, I'm not sure about the time. And all of a sudden, somebody handed when my father was going from, from his work, as they were walking all the colony back to the ghetto, somebody, which wasn't a Jewish person, had given my father a note. And he, of course, grabbed it, and he came with it to the ghetto as he walked into the house. And we came up from the basement, and we opened up the note, and we found out it was for my mother. For some reason, she was able to give it to somebody, and it must have traveled like six to eight months until it came to our destination. And we found out, and we hoped, that she is still alive. When there was an announcement made in the ghetto that there is another transport going to Latvia, Riga, and if the note was correct, that's where my mother was, we just voluntarily enlisted to go with that transport. And my father put it to us, here we are sitting, two little girls, and he's asking us that maybe we can find, maybe we can find mommy somehow. Um, we as kids said, yeah, we want to go. And what if we don't make it, he said. What if they take us somewhere else? <coughs> it's okay, daddy, let's go. And so they put us in cattle cars for 48 hours, where a cattle car should only hold maybe 200 people. We were 500 pushed into that cattle car. There wasn't even any sitting room. 
They gave us a pail of water with one cup and one empty one for other purposes. They gave us each a piece of bread. And this is how they locked us in for 48 hours and didn't let us out. We didn't see anything, we didn't hear anything. And just people from the, the stench and not eating died all around us. When we finally arrived at the destination, first they took out all the bodies, and there were quite a few. And then they let all of us out. We couldn't even look because our eyes were so used to the dark. Everything hurt it from not sitting, not standing. I mean, you were just like sardines in a can. And then they loaded us up in trucks and took it to another ghetto, which was in another state, which was in Latvia, a neighboring state. They killed all the Jewish population in that state, and they needed more slave laborers, so they kept transferring us wherever we needed, and always made selection while they transferred whoever couldn't work, and they used to take them away, and we never saw them again. In that camp, and this is how we found my mother, because she was a designer of women's clothing, and she was very good at her, at her trade, and the captain of the camp had found out about it, and he used to bring her materials and measurements and she was making designers clothes for his family that he used to ship to his family in Germany. And when she found out that there was another transport that came from Lithuania, she figured she'll approach them. Maybe there is somebody from her family there. And sure enough, she found out we were there. And he sent two military men at night and they took us out of that camp where we were and actually smuggled us out to my mother. But at the same time, we lost my father. And my mother took us where she worked so we helped her. So we used to darn the, the socks for the military and all that, whatever they needed. And my little sister used to peel potatoes in their kitchen. And that didn't last long because there weren't, was a new selection in ghetto and they found out that most of the Jewish students that were in that ghetto and there were about 150 of them. They were digging a tunnel so they could leave the ghetto and go into the woods so they could at least go and fight in any way they could. And for some reason, somebody gave it away and they discovered it. And they lined up all these 150 young men that were 18 or 19 college students. And we had to watch as they shot them and they were falling. 150 of young men. Then they started to liquidate to get them, shipping us out by boats from the Baltic Sea to the concentration camp. By then, 
I was already like two and a half or three years older because it was already that long that we were in the camps. And they brought us to the concentration camp and that was in Poland. Poland was one country that had most of the concentration camps in Europe. I guess the Germans made them a lot of promises and they were able to do whatever they wanted to in their country. When they unloaded us and brought us to this big area, all we can do is smell the putrid smell. And ash were flying, not really ash pieces, but as fine as like you would flick a cigarette off, cigarette ashes. And that was all in the air. And the smell, that was the most predominant, but we didn't know what it was. And there was nobody to, to ask, what is it that we're smelling? Because up to that point, we were not exposed to crematoriums, and we didn't know. As they started taking us into the barracks, there were huge barracks. And there were bunk beds, not bunk beds like you kids know. These were made out of raw wood, and they were like three stories high, and they were very narrow, and they put like four women in one of those bunk beds, which means there were 12 in one of those scaffolds. You had to tuck your knees in, Otherwise, the person across from you didn't have any room where to put their legs. So you were like two against each other, just sitting up. And those bunks were very wobbly. And if you re really moved, they could collapse. And if one of those bunk beds would collapse, as a reward, they used to come in with a water hose, not a water hose that you used to water the lawn, but one like the firemen use. And if that power of the water hit you, we used to be thrown from one wall to the next, which was maybe 200 feet to the next wall of that barrack. And in that camp, in the winter time, they used to give you silk dresses. And in the summertime, they used to give you warm clothes. They used to take you out, outside every morning, whether it was hot or cold, it didn't matter. Mostly when it was raining or snowing, until you really got all wet and the clothes used to freeze on you. And they wouldn't even let you go to the washroom for days. But the washrooms were very clean. But you couldn't use them. They wouldn't let you in there. Some, some people died of your own poison. And they used to keep us like sometimes for eight hours sometimes longer, whether it was snowing or raining. And the only way you could leave that camp is either if you died or you throw yourself on the wire and the wire was electrocuted. And every morning we used to walk out and we used to find somebody that just had enough, and that was the only way out. One morning we walked out, 
and there was this young woman on the wire, and this officer with his high hat and his shiny boot walks over to my mother, and he calls her like this, and his face smirks. And of course, my mother had to go reluctantly, and she must have noticed that the two of us kind of made a motion to maybe follow her. And as she turned halfway, we knew that we shouldn't move because you kind of develop a mute language. And she was very wise. I don't know where it came from, but she was always able to save us from everything around us. And as she was walking toward the fence, and he saw she was reluctant to walking slow because she knew what could it mean. He wants her to jump on the fence. He walked ahead of her, picked up his leg, and put his shiny boot on the wire to show her that she shouldn't be afraid. They cut the power. She tried very hard to pull the young woman off the wire, but apparently her, her hands were totally embedded and burned from the prongs of the wire. And so was her body. So he called out to more women and they finally got the young woman off the wire. And they laid her on the, on the ground. And my mother came back in line. That night, when they took us back to the barracks, and I saw my little sister dozing off, and I was hoping she was asleep. I asked my mother, I said, Mom, don't you think we have enough and we should do the same, the same thing? I cannot possibly picture any of you to understand this that at my age, to talk to my mother about dying. And she said to me, I'll make a deal with you. If you find me one morning on the wire, the next morning, Take your sister, be sure you take your sister by the hand and do it. We didn't talk about it. And the front line at that point came closer and closer to the camp. That night, the Russian Meeks were flying just <laughs> crazy all around the camp. <coughs> but not one bomb they dropped on the camp. Everything on the outskirts. And what they did when they came, they threw out these little flares that lit up the whole sky. And we used to call those Christmas trees. I mean, it was like daylight. I don't know what it meant, but we figured to throw a bomb, enough is enough. Not just outside, in here, but they never did. Two days later, we need 40 women to do some kind of labor, like 40 kilometers out of the camp. And of 
course, we, we would do anything because this was a first. How do you know if they're telling the truth or if they're not telling the truth? Because every time they took some people out, they never returned, we never saw them again, and that smoke and that uh, smell was always there. It's kind of, it became part of you. But we figure we take a chance. Anywhere going is better than being here. If, if this is the end, let it be the end. The faster the better. So as we were standing in line, my mother was in front of me and my sister was in back of me. And he kind of, the assessment holds her back and he says, uh, he kind of held her up. And I just put my arms on her back and I said, oh, she can work like a horse. And I pushed her through and I ran after her. And my sister ran after me. And we went out to the other camp for, for that labor, whatever. But two nights before that happened, I had such an urge to just run out of the barrack. I said, I don't care what happens to me. And my mother couldn't catch me, and my sister couldn't catch me. And I ran so fast, and I ran outside. And I just wanted to come near the man's camp, where it was separated by barbed wire. No, I didn't know why I was running. But something either pushed me or dragged me. And as <coughs> I was running, I saw this man running toward the wire. And then I heard him yelling, my child, my child. And as I was coming closer, I saw it was my father. And it's like two assessments grabbed him, threw him to the ground, and two women assess grabbed me and threw me down. And they said, I heard them saying, you're gonna get five lashes. And I heard them yell, that he was going to get 25. Now, I remember getting the first one. That's all. When I woke up, I was in the barracks, and my mother was over me. I guess she must have torn off a piece of her clothing, and all we had was water. And that's what she used to pat my back. And speaking of somebody having nine lives, that's me. I have nine lives. Now you kids are gonna think I'm strong, I'm a hero, I'm whatever. No, I'm not. My reward would be if I reach one of you, just one of you, to make a better world. <coughs> that would be my reward. You kids are gonna ask me, <coughs> how come I came to the school to talk? It took me 50 years to do that. And I have to tell you how it happened. I have two daughters. They got married. I have two wonderful son-in-laws. And I have four grandsons that are the pride and joy of my life. I feel like a farmer and they're my crop. My oldest <coughs> grandson is going to ASU. And one day he came to me 
Not that I never talked to them about it. I did always answer their questions, whatever they asked me, whatever they wanted to know. But he sat me down at the kitchen table, took out this little cassette, and said to me, Bobby, it's time for us to have a talk. Bobby is Yiddish for grandma. I said, how, how do I do that, I said. I said, why don't you start by asking me questions? And he did. We sat for probably three hours. He's telling me he's going to write an essay on the Holocaust. And he needs my input. Input, okay? Whatever you want to call it. And this is how I really opened up, really, for the first time. <coughs> and then I was approached by the Jewish veterans from World War II, which is Mr. Nimrod. And he kind of drafted me. He didn't give me a choice. He said, this is important, and you have to do it. I said, I feel like a dinosaur. I'm, we're a dying breed. We're all getting old. And he said, that's what you're here for, <laughs> to get older. And you've got to talk to the kids to make them understand how important it is for the kids to create a better world. Now, I'm looking at your kids. I love children. And I'm wondering. If you kids really know the opportunities and everything that is ahead of you, that is given to you as a gift geographically because where you're located, you never had a war. You don't know what it means. But you have all these opportunities. Be grateful. Listen to your teachers, listen to your parents. Be better people. Treat your next person the way you want to be treated. On the inside, if you would turn us inside out like a coat, we would all look the same. There is no color, there is no race. We all have the same organs. My mother used to call this the library. Everybody has to carry a library. This is where you, you get your strengths, your knowledge, and this is where your existence is. One of the children in one of the schools had asked me, do you hate the Germans? I had just started. And it took me a little back. And I figured, why would he ask me this? I took a deep breath and I said to him, if I would start hating, there wouldn't be enough people in the world for me to hate. Because in the beginning, nobody helped us. I would have to hate the whole world for what happened to us. It would consume me. Nobody can exist on hate. It's impossible. It's a st stronger than love. It's stronger than anything. Whatever you kids learn, hate is something you are taught. You are not born with it. You cannot pick it up without wanting to pick it up. You let it consume you. But like I said, if I reach one of you, so you can make a better world, that's my reward. That's why I talk to you kids. When I was liberated, and I was liberated by the Russians, and 
I think they're the best, in those days they were the best soldiers that ever were. If they could stand and fight Nazi Germany all by themselves for such a long time without any help, that makes them the best soldiers in the world. And they were the ones that liberated me. They were my heroes. I was very sick when I was liberated. I had typhoid, which they fed us in the soup. It's like now it's going on about uh, in Iraq with everything they want to find out. This is what they gave us. And what it does to you, it kills you, one way or another. I survived because I got it at the end of the war and I got help right after the war from the Russian military doctors. It took me six months to be able to stand up, not just to walk, six months to stand up. And when that happened and I could stand up and make a few steps, I said to my mother, Mom, I need to go to find out and to see what my last voyage was supposed to be like. She grabbed her head. She said, why would you want to see that? Why would you want to go back? I said, I need to do that. I just need to do that. But you had to have permission. Six months after we were liberated to go to a camp, you needed permission. And she went to that commander and they gave permission for me to go. So we all went. We went to Majdanek, we went to Treblinka. I said, I just don't want to see the camp. I want to go into the crematorium. And these two Russian soldiers took us and we walked through the showers and I looked at those and I said, where was the whole world? And as we walked into the crematorium, they were like, the ovens were like horseshoes, either five or six next to each other. And there was this metal gurney. It was very narrow because what was left of a person after four and a half years wasn't much. They didn't need a bigger gurney. And as I was holding it and I tried to push it in, I must have fainted. Or, because again, as I woke up, I was outside. Somebody had given me some smelling salt. And the Russian soldiers drove us back to where we were residing. They opened up, they called it like a DP home for displaced persons that had nowhere to go. Because at that point, nobody really wanted us. Mr. Nemro was one of the soldiers that liberated the camp where my late husband was, which was Dachau. Because they used to ship big transports back to Germany for slave labor. And that's where my late husband was liberated. As far as my children, I look upon them as I look upon you. You are the ones that are going to run the future world. You have a big legacy. I'm wholeheartedly asking you, don't let history repeat itself. 
it's been going on through the ages with the Spanish Inquisition, with everything you can think of. We were always the ones that were first in the line to be blamed, to be killed, to be not really reckoned with. Anybody all over the world would trace places with any of you because of all the possibilities that you have. You know, they have now the commercial Fisher Price toys. You look at the toy and the commercial states, the possibilities, and they're talking to babies for knowledge. This is where you get all your knowledge. Create your own libraries so you can store it away for the future, learn from it. Make yourself into good people. Make your teachers and your parents proud of you. I want to thank all of you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, just go ahead, fire away. Yes? I was wondering, what happened to your father? <sighs> Toward the end of the war, a lot of the Germans started running away and hiding. They took the Jewish people and put them in barns, on farms, just transported them, not by car, not by anything, just walking like you chase cattle. Used to put those in the, in the empty barns, set the barns on fire, and whoever tried to run away, spray them with bullets. <coughs> My father was in one of the group that tried to run away. He sprayed them with bullets, and there were maybe about a dozen men. He tore off both his legs. It took him three days to die, three days before the war ended. Have you been to the Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C.? Not yet. You plan on going? I don't know. I would love to. But maybe I need a little more time. Yes? Um, like, I think there's a reason that you guys seem to like the survivors. They have, like, such like crazy situations where they just luck out. And there's so many quiet survivors. Do you like have like any words for quiet survivors? Uh, I don't know anybody that really had a breakdown or collapsed. Maybe because we are a fighting breed, breed or something. Because after the war, I promised myself I would never ever let anybody call me a dirty Jew or turn my other cheek because we were like sheep. It's not, Lithuania wasn't a country like this where every household practically has a gun. We didn't have anything to fight with and nobody would help or give us anything to fight with. So, why didn't you fight, why didn't you fight? What do you fight with? against guns and ammunition. What? Your mouse? First bullet will hit you. My parents didn't fight because they had young kids to see if they could bring them through. And not every parents were able to bring uh, their children through all this Holocaust. I mean, that's why I look upon my mother like she was an angel. Who in, in, in your mind could have so much foresight <coughs> in the beginning of the war 
to put on papers. You have little kids, you write them down as 20 years old, and you push up their hair. It's an impossible task. And I just lost her a couple of years ago. And she was my guiding light. Um, in some of the in some of the books that we've been reading in in our class, we uh, we've seen that like some of the authors who wrote them um, question their faith in God or question their beliefs. Um, did you ever question your beliefs during the Holocaust? You or always you? question. But if somebody can do that to me, that believes maybe in a different God, how is his God any better than mine? If he can pick up a gun and kill little kids or drain them of their blood, is his God better than mine? Maybe mine fell asleep, I don't know. But at least he didn't kill anybody. I don't know what the answer is. But no, I don't think anybody's religion is better than mine. Okay. That was the bell. Would everybody please thank Mrs. David for coming? And if you guys have any questions, if you have time, you may stay and ask.